This morning, uh, uh, he is professor of sociology and criminal justice at Carthage College in Kenosha, where he joined the faculty in 1998. Uh, his, he has graduate degrees from the University of Arizona and the University of Connecticut. Uh, in his earlier years, he served on the research staff of the Presbyterian Church USA, uh, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America and also for the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of New York, New York City. <clears throat> he is obviously a, a, um, a sociologist of religion and more recently a soci uh, sociologist of criminal justice. Uh, he specializes, uh, it says in his bio, he will explain this for us, I'm sure, in, in the social dimensions of religion and also in the social dimensions of crime. Uh, his publications include studies of congregational growth and decline and religion and the media. Um, he will speak, make his presentation, and then is, uh, we'll be answering some questions afterwards. So please welcome Wayne Thompson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rustic, and uh, thanks to Wayne Johnson for uh, asking me to give this talk. I've done a little bit of previous versions of this. Uh, was on the Greg Berg show in on WGTD uh, in the fall, and uh, then gave a talk at Parkside in the Religion and Public Issues. I think it's called the forum. And uh, and now here I'm just delighted to be here with you this morning. My work is uh, really uh, the scholarly work that I do is uh, culture wars inside the churches. You see. So that's the main focus, right, the culture wars inside the churches. This is a little bit of an extension. It's a natural extension for me. What I wanted to do uh, with this talk was to give some background on hate groups, retention, recruitment and retention. Why do people join these groups? Why do some turn violent? Not all of them are violent. Some are. And a little bit of typology. There are different types of hate groups. But one focus I thought would be very interesting uh, that I've worked up here is a focus on homegrown hate groups. Wisconsin has a variety of hate groups that are present in the state. But there are some that are headquartered, if you will, that are Wisconsin-based hate groups. So I get a, I'm going to give you a little focus on that. Hate comes in different forms, and uh, so there will be different types, but also uh, hate groups as, uh, uh, I guess, on our back, in our backyard, in, in uh, where we live. So I thought that would be interesting. We'll walk around Wisconsin and, and see, uh, see some of the groups. And then I want to leave a lot of time for questions, because I'm sure uh, it would be more fun for everybody. Keep it interactive, and I'm sure you have a lot of questions and comments. Uh, you may know the topic better than I do. But I'll show you how a sociologist of religion would look at these hate groups and some of the concepts that we use in sociology more broadly and sociology of religion especially that might shed a little light for you and give some background on why people are in these groups, how the groups operate themselves, and uh, and then some specific um, uh, some specifics about particular groups. So. See what we've got here. A little background. You've got the handouts, so you can follow through on that. Um, okay, hate groups proliferate on the internet. So the internet's a little bit of a newer thing. It's really 1995 when we first had the point-and-click web-based world uh, 
available and indeed there are lots of hate groups there. Many of the people who are following hate groups uh, on the internet through Facebook, uh, Instagram, other uh, social media platforms really constitute what sociologists of religion call audience cults, which is to say they're not all dyed in the wool, really dedicated, committed members. The nature of the web is people can just click around, right? So a lot of the uh, internet-based hate is uh, with a lower level of commitment. People are not as, um, as involved in, deeply involved in the groups. But there are layers of commitment, right? So some people are, but many of the people that are looking on the internet are just sort of clicking their way through. So there's a great deal of interest at that level, but what I, my comments are going to be a little bit more on the more deeply committed members, not just people clicking through uh, on the websites. Though I wanted to mention that because that's the greatest volume of traffic coming through hate groups, but the audience cult concept implies that it's a low level of commitment, right? People are dabbling in hate groups, in other words. And they, another important idea related to that is with audience cults in religion, as with the hate groups, I think, that the low level of commitment means that you can be involved in more than one group at a time, so keep that in mind. So people drift, literally, from group to group. Another point, hate groups are seeking mainstream status through identification with right-wing populist politics. There is a, this is a worldwide phenomenon. It's not just in the United States, although my comments will be focused on the United States and, of course, Wisconsin. Uh, the mainstream status, so what is that? That's legitimacy, the problem of legitimacy, of being accepted, of moving to the center. So one way of looking at this is to argue that the center of a political and social issues discourse in the United States has shifted rightward over the last several decades. And so that makes groups that would have been seen as more extreme seem more mainstream. But there's always the problem of fragility. You know, groups that exist, of any type of group, that exists at the margins of society, most of those groups never survive. They don't make it. They don't last very long. It's difficult to make a living out at the margins. If you can move to wherever the center is, which I've said even the center shifts around, but if you can move to the center, you have a greater chance of survival. And if you think about it, just like basic sociology, who all had a, anybody had sociology in high school or college? Everyone had sociology? Mm -hmm. So a few of you. The basic of sociology, what is the purpose of any group? It's to survive, right? to survive and thrive and grow. And so if you keep that dynamic in mind, then the question, the problematic thing becomes, why do some groups survive when most of them die out? So why do some hate groups survive? Groups like the Klan, they have greater institutional resources, they have inertia, they have more people, and they now have a more kind of mainstream look. Instead of the hoods, they've traded that in for a suit and tie, they run through the mainstream Republican Party, they'll run for political office. Uh, David Duke, one of the Grand Wizards, um, in the Grand Wizards in the KKK, has a college degree uh, and talks about policy initiatives, operates inside the mainstream. So what you see with groups, if they want to survive, they've got to find a way to move to something that you can call a center. And that gives them the legitimacy to keep going. So the mainstream status problem is kind of the, what sociologists would be looking for. But why do some of these groups survive and others do not? Now, the number of hate groups um, have spiked really since about 2009. It's a big spike in the number of hate groups. I will use a lot of statistics, or some statistics anyway, uh, not to give you too many numbers to deal with here, but I'll give you some data from the Southern Poverty Law Center. It's the best known source for data on hate crimes, or hate crimes, I should say, on hate groups. The FBI is the source on the hate crimes. This is what we're talking about is the hate groups. Uh, and many of these groups have very small memberships. Some of them are prone to, more splinter and schism prone, to use the social religion term, uh, than others. Um, but 
the number of groups was the highest in 2011, uh, according to the Southern Poverty Law Center. So why more groups then? Um, it's often uh, suggested in, since uh, the 2016 election that hate groups are spiking now. And there is definitely an increase in hate crimes going on since 2011. But the number of hate groups was actually, there were more of them back in 2011. And the second question is who was president then was Barack Obama. So uh, the, the hate group phenomenon has a couple dynamics going with it right now. There's more legitimacy because of the current president and some of the right-wing populist politics. But the actual uh, number of hate groups, it's not, I wouldn't say declining, but it, it really spiked up high during um, the time of Obama's second election. So right around 2011, 2012. Uh, it's a little bit of a misconception. People, some people think that, that there are more hate groups around right now. That's not exactly true. Uh, historically, it would be true. But in the recent past, it was when Obama was president. They might be motivated for a number of different reasons. Uh, religion, race, class, anti-gay, there are a variety of them, okay, different types. And many of these overlap. So some of the folks that say don't like Catholics may not like uh, independent women or gays, right? So there's often kind of, you know, multiple uh, uh, objects of the hate, I guess you could say, but, uh, but often a kind of main focus. So I'll try to flesh that out a little bit. In other words, they, uh, they're equal opportunity haters, right? But there's often a main focus, uh, particularly groups that they don't like. Oh, and religion and race are, are very, very common reasons, but there are anti-gay groups, and there's a variety out there, which we'll look at, I think, right now would be a good point to do this. Actually, you have the graphic. It's in your little talk. I've got a, a bar chart. I'm going to type them up here. Here. So here is a, uh, this is data from the Southern Poverty Law Center for 2016. So in terms of just the sheer number of groups, and keep in mind many of these groups are very small. But this, for sheer number of groups, black separatist groups has more numbers. Why that particular <coughs> segment of the um, uh, religious and uh, hate group uh, population of organizations? Why that would be uh, uh, the black separatist groups are more schism prone, I'm not sure. Next study, next book. Um, now I'm curious why. Many of these groups, keep in mind, are very, very small. Okay. Ku Klux Klan isn't just one organization. There, there is a, uh, a social network between the Klan organizations, but they also have been particularly schism prone. And uh, kind of like Mormons, where Mormons, the fundamentalist Mormons, there's always another charlatan claiming that they're the prophet, mm -hmm. right? This goes on with the hate groups as well. And uh, the schism, 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 fascinating topic of why groups split off from the original group. Well, that's a topic that applies to hate groups as well. Anti-Muslim. This is more recent. Until the 1970s, there weren't that many Muslims in the United States. They're only about 1.3%, my own calculation using surveys, now compared to about 10% in many European countries. So the anti-Muslim, oh, let's get our sign back. Got us here, sign. Oh, that's the sign. So the anti-Muslim groups, a relatively new phenomenon, recent phenomenon, until the 1970s, there, were, there was an Arab American population, but, uh, they, and they largely concentrated around uh, Detroit and Toledo, Ohio. Remember Jamie Farr from MASH, who was part of that. These were largely Christians. They were often called Syrians, right? All Muslims were called Syrians back then. All Arabs were called Syrians. Most, until the 1970s, most of the folks in the Middle East who are in the United States were Christian, or at least half, even today. It's true, but we have a growing Muslim population and growing anti-Muslim, uh, number of anti-Muslim groups. 
general hate, well, that's because it's hard to classify some of these groups as they have, uh, they're equal opportunity haters. They hate different, uh, more than one, more than one uh, 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 boogeyman for them. Uh, and the neo-Nazi groups, well, this is more common. A lot of people are more familiar with the neo-Nazi uh, uh, groups. When you think of Charlottesville, for instance, which was just this last fall, uh, the image that often comes to mind are the, are the, um, the neo-Nazis. And I do want to talk about a particular neo-Nazi group in Milwaukee. So we'll come back to that. There are other neo-Nazi groups in Wisconsin, but there's one in Milwaukee that's founded here. Okay, uh, racist skinhead, uh, anti-LGBT, neo-Confederate, uh, and Christian identity. The Christian identity movement, I think that some of the general hate groups actually could be classified down here. So the, the classification is somewhat arbitrary. You know, they go through the list, they look at the websites of these groups, uh, personal knowledge, and they put them in a category. So, but this is one way of seeing how the hate groups separate out. The problem with the, uh, the disappointing thing, or frustrating thing, I think, for uh, assessing the Southern Poverty Law Center data is that they're only counting number of groups, they're not counting the membership. It's very difficult to count the membership of these groups, and as I said, people drift in and out of them all the time. And so they might belong to multiple groups. Very difficult to get an idea of the, uh, the support. Uh, although if you're you know, wondering what is, the, what is the reservoir, the well, the pool of support for hate in the United States, I mean you had 62 million people vote for Donald Trump. Did all of them have uh, frustrations and anxiety about groups that they don't like? Uh, many of them did. Even that's hard to really sort out what they might have been thinking, if it was for economic reasons, if it was for uh, other reasons. The uh, research coming out of the University of Michigan that I've seen, where they try to parse out how much of the Trump election was frustration, economic frustration, you know, white working class people, dominant immobile, small town declining, that type of motivation. How much of it was antipathy toward uh, what we sociologists call outgroups. And really, the economic frustrations doesn't explain much of the variability in voting behavior in the 2016 election. What does explain is this type of thing. It's antipathy, anger about other groups that might be gaining on us, right? And getting a foothold. So uh, this is just one classification of the type of groups, but it doesn't really tell you how many people. Let me go back to the PowerPoint and walk you through some other issues that we can address. Okay, um, so more background. Some hate groups evolved to have more loyalty and commitment, but the internet groups less, as I said. The social networks provide access to subcultural support. That helps when they can do it face to face, but a lot of it's happening online now. Right? Where you don't really get to know the people as well. And they can do what? They co construct their worlds. If you just go back to basics and think about where we get our values from. Where we get our understanding of the world from. We get it in intimate relationships with other people in close interaction with them. And so the internet doesn't lend itself as well to that. Okay? And so what is it that they become converted to? I'm going to argue here that what they become converted to isn't so much the beliefs of the hate groups as the relationships. They become dependent on the relationships. What you're hearing in the media reported is tribalism the tribalism of our culture. That has to do more with belonging than with meaning, I would argue. Both are involved, of course. But you can't get the meanings anyway until you have the relationships. So a lot of it's about my tribe. That's why it's very difficult to argue about social issues based on studies and logic, kind of wasting your time, right? Why? Because people are loyal to their tribe. Once they've decided they're in a tribe, it's kind of over. Of course, a lot of st statistics comes from, come from Southern Poverty Law Center. Their definition of a hate group, I think, is, uh, could be debated. And I'm not sure how much uh, wisdom we get from any one definition, uh, if it's too narrow or too broad. But this is what Southern Poverty Law Center is using. Beliefs or practices 
that attack or malign an entire class of people, typically for their uh, for characteristics you're born with, or at least that society attributes to you, whether or not you feel like that's who you are inside. And that's often based on physical characteristics, not always. Uh, but, uh, but it's, you know, prejudice and discrimination are the worst when it's based on something physical, something you can see, something visible. And so in our culture, what would be the most visible characteristic we use to discriminate and express prejudice? Yeah. Gender. Gender is a big one. You can often see, usually, you know, because boys and girls are raised to dress differently, wear hair differently, all that stuff. Race. Different body. But race, especially because of skin color. So race and ethnicity is another one of those physical things you can you can discriminate more easily if you can see somebody, but it would also be like, you know, weight, height, uh, physical things. If you could see it, it's easier to do to be, uh, to discriminate and, and uh, act out on prejudice, and it develops prejudice more uh, virulently if it's something phys uh, visible. <clears throat> but also, you know, physical disability. Uh, you can, uh, if you could think of any president, past or current, that may have you know mocked physical disability at one point. You remember that speech that Trump gave? Yeah, right. Trump gave the speech that he's mocking a reporter who we had. Uh, I think he might, might have had cere cere cerebral palsy or muscular dystrophy. I'm not quite something sure. Like that, yeah. Something like that. So he's mocking, right? So anything physical, it's easier to discriminate based on that. But uh, suppose the characteristics as well. Uh, so you know, like gay people. Do you know who gay people are physically? Not necessarily, you know. And so that creates opportunities to, uh, uh, for some people to avoid the gays of the hate groups and uh, uh, others where you can't. So what do the hate groups do? They're gonna find you one way or another, whether it's based on the way you look or based on your group affiliations, where you're at at a certain time and place. So this isn't the perfect definition, but it'll do for a starting definition. Well, they have poverty in their name. I don't see them going after poverty. <laughs> um, well, I, I would argue that there are hate groups organized against poverty. That is, poor people are the object of it. I'll give you an example of that. I grew up in a little town up in northern Wisconsin. grew up in a farm up there in Clark County the poorest county in the state, other than where my cottage is now, Vios County, where it's 60% Indian. Clark County is where the poor white people live, also all by La Crosse, a lot of poor people living out in the countryside. When we would go, uh, my mom, for a time, had to go on welfare. So we would go to get our government commodities, you know, they're talking about these boxes again, you can get a box of food. So we would go to get our box of food once a month, and we would get the, some really bad government meat in a can, and the flake mashed potatoes. Some of you are old enough to know what this was. You get the, the cheese and the butter and all that. Mm -hmm. We would go, and some folks in the town, too many, would show up there as we went once a month to get our, our box off the truck, and they would sit there and hurl slurs. Welfare cheat, welfare loafer, shame on you. We were poor kids on the farm, we had to eat. So imagine, this is a very formative experience. So hate can be based on Poverty as well, you know, anti-poverty. Uh, uh, you have anti-poverty crusaders that are trying to do something about poverty to get people out of poverty, and you have those that are demonizing people who are poor. So poverty can be uh, another characteristic that that brings the, uh, uh, you know, brings this kind of demonization, vilification around it. I experienced it as a kid myself. Okay, some hate groups evolved to have more loyalty and commitment. Not all. I want to focus more on those that do have the deeper commitment to really understand a little bit here what are the dynamics that get people really to go the hook, line, and sinker, the deeper level of commitment into these groups. Um, get to the next slide here. here we go. So, has the current president emboldened hate groups? I think the data on that is. Uh, is yeah points toward the direction that indeed these groups are feeling uh, emboldened. Uh, 
indeed, uh, when you have support from the top of the political uh, and cultural hierarchy, uh, then that's what the problem of what sociologists call legitimacy. You have the legitimacy to come out and do that. Uh, and uh, if you think about the language of the crowd at Charlottesville, uh, the, uh, the skinheads and so on that were, that were uh, the neo-Nazi groups and so on that were marching, what were they saying? Do you remember what they were chanting as they were marching? Jews shall not replace us. So you know there's an anti-Semitic element in that one. So, uh, is the current president then emboldening the hate groups? Uh, there is a lot of anecdotal evidence to suggest that that indeed is happening, uh, but the presence of a black president probably emboldened the hate groups even more is uh, a little bit of a surprise. If I was sitting in the audience with you all, I might be a little surprised to hear that, but, uh, but it makes sense. So, okay, that when you, why, did, why do these groups feel emboldened? When you feel a threat from social and cultural pluralism, and you feel that that's personally threatening to you, if you think about the imagery of a ladder. So you're on the ladder, and think about where the white working class sits now. They've had 40 years of factories closing, uh, and deindustrialization, seen their communities decline, certainly small town America and rural America, they've experienced this. All is about loss and mourning everywhere. Yet, they sit on the ladder still above recent immigrants, many recent immigrants. They sit on the ladder above African Americans who are in inner city neighborhoods. They uh, sit above American Indians on the reservation and in urban areas. So there is still a hierarchy there. But you feel the threat, not from the people way up the top who may indeed be picking your pocket through massive tax cuts for billionaires, you feel the threat from those who are below you, and especially from those who are just a few rungs below you. You think they're gaining on you. So that would be a place to look for what's going to engender this feeling of social threat. But, and I'm not even saying that there really is a social threat. It's a perception that there's a threat. The social and cultural pluralism takes us beyond race to look at, for instance, some of the LGBT, anti-LGBT crimes and uh, other groups that are viewed as, as different, okay? So difference is perceived as threatening. Whether it's based on sexual orientation or race, that can still be the motive for joining these hate groups. So according to the Census Bureau, look at the social and cultural pluralism that's coming in. Whites will be a statistical minority by 2040. Uh, perhaps sooner, it depends on the uh, birth rates and so on. Currently, six, uh, the U.S., 16% Latino, 13% black, 61% white non-Latino. The numbers get a little bit bigger because Latinos can be of any race. So if you're thinking, Thompson, no, that's me, uh, and I teach statistics too, that I can't add up because it's over 100%, that, that, there's a reason why it gets to over 100%, uh, because it's a little bit difficult, um, figuring especially the Latino population can get uh, counted more than once. But, and the numbers for Racine, too, I look at the Racine data. I mean, Racine is, as I, as I recall from the 2010 census, I think Racine's, what, about 18% African American, uh, maybe 9, 10% Latino, uh, and, uh, you know, did white flight to the suburbs. All these same dynamics are happening in this community. So, uh, very similar, Kenosha, same thing. And you have some other folks, 6% uh, Asian. So what's the fastest growing racial and ethnic group in America? My students always say, well, the Latinos. They're the fastest growing very large group, but actually Asians are the fastest growing group. Mm -hmm. And in Wisconsin, we have a very small Asian population, not very large. Uh, the Midwest in general, don't, we don't see a lot of that, but the Asians are the fastest growing. And Latinos also growing. So I would say uh, at the current rates of growth and so on, whites are gonna be a statistical minority quite a bit before 2040, but the Census Bureau is projecting 2040. And where is 2040? That's not very long from now, okay? It's happening very quickly. So the sense of threat about pluralism, right? Uh, there are also religious minorities, I wanna point out, being a sociologist religion. Uh, my calculation is about 1.3% Muslim. 
2% Jewish, down from 3% Jewish just a generation ago. So the Jewish population has declined. You know, and uh, it is, uh, it might not seem like much when my students say, well, 3%, 2%, it's not very big. But if you're Jewish, 3% to 2% is a third of the Jews are gone. Well, what happened there? And yet, there's a rise in anti Semitism. Saw an article the other day uh, that uh, uh, figures from the Anti Defamation, what is it, Anti Defamation League, I think they call it, uh, that the 2017 was the um, biggest year ever, big increase in anti-Semitic uh, events. So, uh, I don't know, the 1%, I think I was just typing fast. So it's, I want to point out that, that we have religious minorities as well that are, you could say, are religio-ethnic groups, and they're the objects often of hate. There's an ethnic element to them as well as a religious element. So that hatred would be, how would you classify it? It's religious, as race, it's like, yes, 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 all, all of that, right? So again, kind of hard to classify some of this stuff. Most recognized hate groups, of course, are on race, religion, and now sexual orientation is kind of a, a big thing, and Islamophobia, right? So it's like uh, new cottage industries and hate groups, right? So what's up and coming? Anti-LGBT, anti-Muslim, and uh, other bases for hate. Anti-intellectuals, that's a big one, too. They ought to get us. They don't like us. They don't like us. They don't like groups like yours giving, having people like me come and give talks that are maybe in some ways unflattering to the hate groups. Since 2000, there is definitely an increase with, uh, uh, during Obama's second term is when it really peaked. Now, the Wisconsin hate groups, I promised you it's a real badger land type of look at this. So I'm going to talk about a couple of, three groups actually. Uh, that I want to highlight that are not only present in Wisconsin, there are many hate groups present here. The Klan, there's history of, I can tell you stories I know from Racine and the Ku Klux Klan is a history here, but you may already know some of the history. Uh, I met people, who, when I went to college at Carthage in the 70s, I met a woman who said that uh, she had, uh, when she was young, she would sew the hoods, you know, the royal hoods. You got hate groups in Racine too. You already know that. Probably the motivation for this group, right, as a pushback against that. But let's look at uh, the, the state. There are others. Um, uh, Milwaukee Jewish Federation sees anti-Semitic incidents higher than ever, and now the Anti-Defamation League is coming out and confirming that. Uh, about a dozen hate groups known to the Southern Poverty Law Center that are operating chapters here. But those are just the ones that the Southern Poverty Law Center uh, knows well. I saw an article in, the, might have been September, October, in the Wisconsin Gazette, one of those alternative weeklies up in Milwaukee, where they uh, identified um, far more, okay? So the Southern Poverty Law Center, they're taking a nationwide look, they have certain definitions, they uncover some things, but when you live here in Wisconsin, uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg sticking out. Right? There's more. And there's a lot of unorganized hatred, right? We're just talking about the actual, you know, where the coalesces into groups. So, um, headquartered in our state are the Samantha Roy group. I want to talk about a little bit about the Pilgrim Covenant Church in Monroe and a neo-Nazi group called the New Order in Milwaukee. The Samantha Ray, in some ways, is... Um, uh, for your entertainment, uh, though it's a very serious topic, uh, it is uh, in many ways a, to me, a fascinating group. So I want to talk about them first. Would that be someone against like the Native Americans? I know there's a lot of Native Americans up in Shawano and in that area. Um, I don't know. They're, they're anti-Catholic. I'll come back to them oh. a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting in many ways, but uh, to kind of get beyond just the race hatred part, we'll talk about a neo-Nazi group that's more the race hatred, so we're going to kind of broaden it out. And then the church in, in, uh, in Monroe, it's anti-gay, <coughs> anti-woman, and they're not fond of Catholics either. So. Yep, different folks they, they don't like. So let's do some concepts first. We'll come back and talk about the groups. Insights from social religious. So that's mainly where I've learned it, and I teach a course in deviant behavior at Carthage. 
uh, during the January term, which uh, every frat boy on campus wants to get in there because they think they did behavior, right? It's January. Uh, uh, but that's the perspective I'll bring in. There's a little bit of theories and concepts from the study of deviant behavior, some from sociology of religion, see if it, if it uh, and some studies of race prejudice too, I think are helpful. Some basic concepts like what is prejudice, what is fundamentalism, uh, kind of how sociologists would look at this. So uh, here's one of my favorite books, that 1951 I think was written, well it's like a smart board every time you touch it, that's cool. Um, Eric Coffer is actually just a longshoreman. Anybody ever heard of Eric Coffer? Not many people know this guy. He was a longshoreman, but you know, in, in Portland, Oregon. But you read his books, and here he knew all the great classics and Socrates, and it's like this guy was well read. And he gives some insights into what mass movements are all about. And I think it's relevant. His insights are relevant to understanding fundamentalist hate groups. So. Mass movements, he says, are started by the frustrated individual, and I think that's a key concept. Why are people frustrated? What are they frustrated about? In this context, they're frustrated about their status in society, uh, kind of like Archie Bunker, can't get any respect. See, so what happens is that, that uh, people want things that they cannot get, or they perceive that they cannot get, and they perceive other people are getting it, and they're mad at those groups. That's the basic setup. All right, so I, I like it that Hoffer's talking about the frustrated individual. I'll come back to the concept. And the conversion process then of getting these folks into, in our case, hate groups is what we're applying this to, consists basically in the inculcation of fixation of proclivities. Hoffer could turn a phrase, as you can see, and responses indigenous to the frustrated mind. So something about being frustrated. So we need to look more. What are they frustrated about? And then also the other insight is that fundamentalist mass movements require a charismatic authoritarian leader. Uh, that is usually the case with hate groups. There's usually somebody at the, uh, the usually the founder, who has uh, uh, is seen as a person who can walk on water. Right? So in the sociology angle of it, it isn't so much that we believe Jesus walks on the water, but we notice that other people believe Jesus walks on the water. And, or any charismatic leader. So charisma is something we attribute to other people, right? And so it isn't so much whether Jesus walks in the water as that people believe in that, right? So with the hate group leader, uh, they're gonna save us. They view them as a savior, you know? Um, this, let's take time out before I go on with the lecture. Um, what's the largest, what would you guess? What's the largest hate group in the United States? According to the Southern Poverty Law Center, it's the Klan and the various main Klan groups. But really, the largest hate group is often uh, accused is the NRA. It's the largest hate group in America. Are people joining for gun rights, or are they joining because there are certain people in the population that they're afraid of and don't like? That would be the question that I'm raising about that. So the, the fundamentalism, I want to look at fundamentalism a little bit more too, give you some more concepts. We'll get to the point where you can We'll get to talking with each other, so I'm not just lecturing at him. The status frustration concept, that comes straight out of criminology or the study of deviant behavior. A sociologist uh, named Robert Merton was a Columbia sociologist back in the 1930s. He's the guy that kind of uh, developed the whole New Deal under FDR. He talked about blocked opportunity structures. People want to be successful, but they cannot get there and that led to the entitlement programs in the 1930s. So Merton was a big heavy other guy. Uh, I had the pleasure to meet when he was 92 years old, I met him at a cocktail party, and I said, you so inspired me with all this status, frustration, all that stuff, and all he wanted to talk about was the New York Yankees. Okay, 92, he can talk about what he wants to. Uh, but, uh, so here's Merton's spin on this. The deviant as a person has got a problem to solve, and that problem is the gap between what they hope for and what they realistically think they're going to get, and it makes them angry. Okay, Status frustration, then, results from subjective feelings of somebody else is doing better than me. What is relative deprivation? Felt relative deprivation is what sociologists call it. That's a feeling that somebody else is doing better than you. And you know when you get that feeling? 
you're sitting at your house and you see those Steinhoffel trucks pull up all the time. The neighbors are thinking, I didn't know they were making that much money. And then how come they have a new car every two or three years? Or how come they have a new pickup truck? So you see all these pickup truck commercials and they're thinking, I don't have a new Ford F-150. The other guys do. And what does that do? It makes you angry. It makes you frustrated. Because in our culture, we compare ourselves not to some absolute standard. We compare ourselves to supposed others that are doing better than us. You see, and it has a kind of boogeyman aspect of it, right? There's some bad group that's getting unfair privileges, and we've got to go out and stop that and turn that about and take back our power. Whether it's men in the old Promise Keepers movement, if you remember that from the early 2000s, and where men had to take back their power in the family, whether it's uh, racially based hate groups and so on. This is kind of the origin of motives. Why would people join these things? Well, this is why. Because why? If you feel like somebody else is gaining on you, you feel resentful. So there's this large pool of people that could be recruited into the hate groups, right? According to this type of thinking. Now, another one of my professors, actually, Al Cohen, uh, uh, wrote a book back in 1955 called Delinquent Boys. It was about uh, subcultures. Not only do the deviants have uh, a problem to solve, a status problem, a perception that other people are doing better than them, but they do so collectively with other people. They find the other people in their situation. So you notice it wasn't one person marching in Charlottesville. It was a lot of people. Very so they're problem solvers, but they do so in groups, which starts to explain where the groups come from. Here I'm comparing them to juvenile delinquents. I don't know if you catch that, but that's the inspiration for the getting the, the social psychology of it, right? The head game. Now, back to something again, very basic sociology 101 stuff. What is prejudice? Gordon Allport, former president, geez, I didn't even touch it that I love these smart boards. Let's go. All, Gordon Allport uh, was president of the American Psychological Association, a really big, heavy hitter psychologist back in the 50s and uh, through the 70s. And uh, Allport wrote a book called On the Nature of Prejudice, which I read when I was an undergrad, and really made an impression on me about where does prejudice come from in the first place. So prejudice, according to Allport, is a feeling, so it's a subjective feeling you have. Hey, feeling favorable or unfavorable toward uh, a person, a thing, a group, uh, and not necessarily based on actual experience, right? It's uh, uh, oftentimes, it's uh, others that we don't have much contact with that we hate the most. I moved, my mom was a teacher in, in Illinois, uh, in the Chicago suburbs, and uh, she cashed in her teacher's pension, it was the hippie era, 67, bought a pickup truck, that said Villa Park Burner Service on the side, and bought a farm up north, and we all moved up north. So I get up there, and they all, well, they don't like black people. Really? I'm thinking, I don't see any black people. I don't, they don't like Latinos either. Well, I don't see any Latinos up there. Now there are a few. Yeah, they actually have Latinos, because otherwise nobody else would be working the dairy farms up there. So, uh, and the meat uh, packing and all that is, it, uh, so there are Latinos up there now. But uh, very few blacks still, a few Indians. Um, so, but they hated black people. But they never met anybody who's black. It's like, okay, that's interesting. Uh, so, it's not based necessarily on actual experience. Prejudice learned early in life is especially resilient. That's why with folks that are deeply committed to hate groups, you cannot argue with them. Or if they're deeply committed to the perspective, then maybe they're not committed to any group at all. They just have this perspective. You cannot argue with them. You're wasting your time. Robert Reich, uh, the former Secretary of, uh, was he Secretary of? Labor. Labor under Obama. Uh, he said, um, he's often saying, don't try to argue with them. You're not going to get anywhere. That's a waste of time. Why? Because uh, the studies show that when you learn prejudice earlier in life, it's rigid. It's resistant to discrepant information. So nothing they hear is going to make any difference. Rather than looking into the meaning system and attacking that, saying, well, you're wrong about that, and the research doesn't show that poor people are lazy, or whatever it is, 
You're wasting your time with that. You have to cast your gaze to the relationships. They're hooked on the relationships. Look at the tribal aspect. They're not even listening to you when you're making your arguments. Right? You may have noticed that with what they call the Facebook trolls. You're wasting your time. They're just going to keep nasty taps. They're, you know, and you say, what about this study? What about that study? You're wasting your time on them. Okay. According to this. Why? Because they learned it early in life. It's very deeply ingrained. Prejudice is a normal part of socialization and identity formation in North America. So there isn't, they're not mentally ill. I mean, some of them may be. Uh, some may be, you know, but that's not the explanation of it. Uh, there is uh, maybe some illogic, uh, poor reasoning, uh, there's rigidity, cognitive rigidity, all that stuff is going on. But the real thing is that uh, it is normal to learn prejudice. What is the purpose of a racist society? It is to make little racists in the next generation, right? Exactly. So this is a normal part of pre prejudices as American as apple pie. Uh, Gunnar Myrdal in 1944, a Swedish sociologist, wrote a book called An American Dilemma. Where he says racism is American as apple pie. It's, a, it's part of the, the structure. Alexis de Tocqueville, the French diplomat, came here in the 1830s and he said, you know, you all talk a good game about everybody having an equal chance, but he said, look at slavery and the exclusion of women and all that. You're not quite, you don't uh, walk your talk. He said, this is what de Tocqueville saw that contradiction among Americans. We talk a good game, we don't always make good on that. So it's kind of normal to learn prejudice then. But not necessarily normal in uh, the, across the uh, last 50 years anyway to join hate groups. That seems as a more extreme thing. Right? But the reservoir for hatred goes way beyond the groups. That would be the point there. Here's about conversion. I got a quick touch on that board. Conversion. How do people become converted? This is actually a study done in the 1960s by a UCAL Davis professor who was studying a group called the Doomsday People. Did you ever hear about the Doomsday People back in the 60s? You know who they really, what we call them now? Those are the Moonies, the Unification Church. Back then were known as the Doomsday People. So he's wondering why would anybody join a really extreme group like that? Yes, the, uh, is the purpose of Laughlin's research. So for conversion, a person must experience within a religious problem-solving perspective. So these eight groups, to me, are in a way, they have quasi-religious aspects to them. Right? And oftentimes, like with the Christian identity movement, very explicitly religious. They're enduring, acutely felt tensions that lead themselves to, def uh, lead them to define themselves as seekers. So these are people who are looking for something. They don't want to, uh, in terms of the hate groups, they don't want to just sit in their trailer out in the woods. They want to get up and go do something. My buddy up in Monaco, that I, I grew up redneck, basically, up north on the farm. My buddy who retired up there, uh, he's a big um, conservative Trump guy, and he says, he said, we're, we're packing now. I said, well, you got weapons? I never knew they had weapons before. And I said, does your wife know about you have weapons? Because I grew up with his wife, too. We were all children together. And um, he said, we're packing now because we're going to, this is up in Manaqua, okay? We're going to, uh, because the Sharia law and all this stuff is being imposed. So we're going to stop it. We're going to do something about it. I said, we're going to do something here, packing weapons? He said, yeah, I got the fancy holster, just like in Gunsmoke, where you tie it up and then got the whole deal. And I said, you're talking about those jokers who work at the meat department, the IGA in Manaqua. You've been talking to them again? Your wife told you not to talk to those guys anymore. You know? So they're all getting guns and whatever. What are you going to do with the guns? Says, We're going to get the Muslims. And I'm thinking, in Manaqua? You're kidding me. What, like all two Muslims that exist in the whole county or whatever? Um, so, you know, perceived threat, right? But they uh, interpret everything through their perspective, right? No matter what happens, they've got their two or three sentences. It's just like... Uh, Rock and roll is all based on three chords, right? Is that three chords? That's the whole paradigm. And you can only do so much in that paradigm, but there are people that that's the world, right? And for any genre of music, right? There's a, there's a, there are limits to it. And there, so everything is siphoned through their worldview. They encounter a turning point. I do this she here, but 
It comes at a turning point in their life. Something. It could be loss of a job. It could be breakup of a relationship. Maybe their wife left them and they got tired of, you know, uh, them surfing the internet all day long and day trading in their tidy whiteies or whatever. Those are actual people. Oh, I'm talking about the Carthage family. Oh, the wife left them. <laughs> day trading all day and bought a bunch of furniture they couldn't afford. So that, but they had turn something, something downturn in their life, right? But I would argue that that downturn in their life is often caused from them joining a hate group. So if you join a hate group and your family starts not wanting to invite you to Thanksgiving dinner, it might be the turning point that caused them to join the group, but it's a reflection that they want to join the group and then all their friends don't want to talk to them. The family quits talking to them. Within their, new, their group, in this case we're playing the hate groups, an affective bond must be formed. This is the key. You see, it's not about being converted to the beliefs as much as it is converted to the relationships. It's about the relationships. So if you have the, like, the meaning side, the beliefs, and the belonging side, the relationships, the research tells us, look at the relationships more, the tribal aspect. Um, it's like in my church, in Lutheran tradition, I grew up Lutheran, many of the people who sit in the pews, if they go out for communion, you ask them, well, what are you doing that for? So, I don't know, because every week we get up at that time, we walk up and we can take communion. So what does it mean? They often don't know. Uh, so it goes with people in hate groups. If you ask them what about the philosophy, they'll say, I'm, I, don't, I don't really know about all that, but we're going to Charlottesville and we're starting, we're going to scream about Jews and that's what we're doing. So that whatever their buddies are doing, that's what they're doing. So look at the belonging aspect, the affective bonds, and I think you have a better insight there. Now, brainwashing, probably not. I'll skip this uh, slide. I think I've co you know, covered most of uh, the rest of this, but it's intensive interaction inside of a group. That's what they're doing inside these groups. And I want to get, I want to talk about the actual uh, three groups. If I can go back to this slide, the, the Wisconsin groups. So I'm giving you some background on why people would join these groups. Uh, so let's look at three Wisconsin groups. Okay, Wisconsin based. <coughs> First of them I find very interesting is Samantha Roy and Shano. These folks are, um, it, it's a, a charismatic leader, de definitely this guy, Samantha Roy, I don't think was even his original real name. He lived in India, became converted to Christianity, I think Roman Catholicism. Uh, found some things he didn't like about it, somehow ends up in Shawano, Wisconsin, a little town outside of Green Bay, 8 to 10,000 people, very close to the Oneida Reservation, you know, Shawano. And uh, they have a compound there, and they also have a compound in India. So it is an international group, but it's kind of based out of, the charismatic leader anyway, is in, is in Green Bay. And recently, they've morphed Jewish. They've decided, that now they're Jewish. Because he converts to, Catholicism, decides he doesn't like Catholics, becomes kind of a evangelical Protestant, and, and now kind of morphing Jewish. It's sociologists, it's like no end to the interesting things happening. So these groups evolve. The Samantha Roy group is, uh, is convinced, the leader at least, and what the group has uh, emphasized is that the local leaders in Shawano are papist agents. That is the police chief, yeah, this gets better and better and better. I'm so happy I went into sociology, it's so cool, you know, so interesting. But the mayor of Shawano, the zoning commission in particular, and the chief of police are accused by these folks of being papist agents, that is, agents of the Catholic Church. It's like, it, it gets more and more interesting as we look at it. And the Lutheran Church, which is my background, as I said, our, Lutheranism is a bestial religion. It's beastly. And I'm thinking, well, I knew that when I was six years old and Pastor Moldenauer was shut up, you know. Uh, it, it's, it, it's, uh, but why, how can they sustain this? A lot of isolation. They don't really mix it up with the locals. They sit out in their compound, and every time the zoning commission comes after them, they got to figure out that it's right from the uh, the um, you know the halls of the Vatican, 
right, coming right after them. I know, you know, I don't know whether to buy them some aluminum foil. We can go out and make pretty little hats, you know. So are it's you fun. saying the white people up there are? are, are the converts are the people, the locals up there. Yeah, okay. yeah. and then some people that followed Samantha Roy from India. Oh. So it's a mixture of who. The, and the size of the group, uh, in, in Shawano, somewhere between 50 and 75 people. And uh, anybody that lives in Shawano would say, oh, those people outside of town, the teenagers harass them all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can imagine. Uh, this other group then, uh, the Pilgrim Covenant, this is a, uh, if you ever heard of Westboro Baptist, some of you know about them, they, a few years ago they came and they were in front of Bradford High in Kenosha, and some of the professors, we went uh, over there in front of Bradford and, you know, called them names back and forth and that sort of thing. Uh, very similar group, okay. They don't like Catholics either, but uh, their main shtick is, at Pilgrim, is uh, gays. They really don't like gays, and they don't like gay rights, okay. So here's a homegrown hate group, religiously based, but the object of the hatred is, uh, is uh, uh, around sexual orientation, and they don't like independent women. That's really bad for them. Uh, so very uh, uh, anti-abortion crusaders, that sort of thing. Um, evangelical Protestant. Uh, interesting in Monroe, because Monroe, if anybody knows, anybody know Monroe? It's a little town on the other side of wood. That's where Father Campion has the blessing of the dogs every year and everything. My brother always goes in there. And he has the, they have the blessing of the mentally disordered people. I know. It's really kind of interesting. Um, dynamic, but uh, uh, Father Campion is, is gone now. He's died. But uh, in the same town. So, uh, a religious group. The New Order is really a, just a, I, I hate to say it this way, but it's your generic stock and trade neo-Nazi group. They're headquartered out of Milwaukee. And it's standard, they don't like blacks and Jews. Uh, there are other groups they don't like. They're not fond of gays and so on. But African Americans and Jews, those are the main groups that they don't like. And this is a national group that happens to be headquartered out of Milwaukee. There are others. In the Wisconsin Gazette article, they identified about a dozen groups that are based out of Wisconsin. I just wanted to highlight these three. Uh, from Wisconsin, we'll open it up to uh, see what you all make of it, all of this. And do questions and stuff. Let's see. Um, well, just a little bit of research on hate, hate groups, and I thought you'd find interesting. Uh, and hate crimes is a much more uh, developed scholarly literature on hate crimes. Not as much on hate groups. It's kind of uncharted territory, which is why I'm going back and why would they join? How do they survive? That sort of thing. Here's one article, uh, or actually a book, um, that's been pretty influential in the study of uh, hate crimes, because uh, they haven't touched much on that. But some of these groups engage in hate crimes, and others just blab their mouths off, right? Well, in this case, hate crime is relative to historical and social context, so defining what is a hate crime will shift across time. And also, I think the object of hate crimes shifts. Uh, sometimes it's ethnic groups, Sometimes it's uh, you know based on sexual orientation. More recently, uh, anti-Muslim. I mean, so the the type of hate crime changes. So you always have to look at the historical and social context. Was a point of that book. Bias-motivated violent crime in the U.S. is a natural natural extension of racism, and homophobia, and so on. A point which I was making earlier that it's there's nothing necessarily mentally disordered about being racist, racially prejudiced. It grows out of the natural socialization, white privilege, and denial of white privilege. It's all part of growing up uh, in America. And that makes a similar point in your book here, using lots of data. Now, uh, this other article I pulled out, because it's kind of interesting, it's about the groups themselves, organizational dynamics of the far right-wing hate groups. Um, and here they say, resources, environmental fit, and organizational characteristics matter which is something similar to saying the social context and so on and that. So, um, and another thing I thought was really interesting about this article, violence increases with the age of the group. So the longer they're around, it's, it's a terrible way to move to the center to get violent, but what they found, when they actually studied these hate groups, the longer they're around, the more likely they will go violent. Why? They weren't sure why. But they did notice that looking at, uh, I think they looked at 90 or 100 groups, 
uh, size. The bigger the group, the more likely to turn violent. Charismatic leadership matters, and it matters in different ways. Sometimes the strong leader at the top can, uh, uh, can lead the group away from violence as well and say, ooh, that'd be bad press, right? So you can imagine David Duke trying to mainstream the Klan and saying, oh, we don't Charlottesville, that's bad PR, right? And, but the, the charismatic leaders, according to this article, can sometimes also push them toward my, more violence. Um, and uh, groups without clear leaders often turn violent as well, they found. Because they're just, they don't have a college graduate at the beginning saying this is bad PR, wouldn't look good in the press, you know, and so it's disorganized. It's just, uh, uh, it's like the rave parties that my college students have. They, um, they just say, there's a march in Charlottesville, show up, we're going to get them. And everybody shows up with a gun or a club, right? So this violence is more likely to break up. The point here is that not all of these groups turn violent. Some do and some don't. And the research is just like at a baby stage of figuring out which groups do and which do not turn violent. I would say to, um, you know, what do you need? These groups have different levels of, of uh, access to resources. Uh, some have money. The Klan is well funded, for instance. Uh, and other groups are just uh, meeting in somebody's trailer and they're hiding the bottle of Southern Comfort behind the couch and swig them when the other guys aren't looking and they don't have any resources, right? It's just the good old boys getting together and complaining. Um, so you have to look at the resources that they have to enact their mission. All of that said, uh, just a couple closing comments I would have for the talk part of it. One is, what about Islamophobia? That's a real up and comer. I mean, what's behind Islamophobia? We don't have as much uh, in terms of the incidence of Islamophobia, that is, attacks of Muslims and so on. We have it. We don't have as much as in Europe. Why not? Well, Europe's 10% Muslim. Or many of the countries now are approaching 10% Muslim. Uh, and so uh, at 1%, we don't, Muslims aren't as visible. Also, Europe has a more working class uh, Muslim population. The United States, many of the Muslims that come here have advanced degrees by the time they ever show up here. Uh, and uh, so, you know, more resources, uh, higher social status, and so on for the Muslims that we have. Yet we do have incidents. Uh, we do have attacks on Muslims. Um, so Islamophobia. So what predicts Islamophobia? I did a multivariate modeling of representative sample of the entire United States I had from 2008 until 2014 um, data. And I modeled, you know, what predicts Islamophobia? So they asked the people questions like, like uh, should a Muslim cleric be allowed to speak? Uh, should their book be taken out of the library? Questions like that. Should they be uh, allowed to teach in a college, university? So based on that, what I found was that those with more authoritarian orientation, those who are more racially prejudiced, and those who are evangelical Protestants uh, are more likely to, uh, to be anti-Muslim. Okay, um, so uh, some of the predictors, the authoritarianism, what is that, the extreme rule-oriented, you know, uh, much, must teach children to obey rules and rules, 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 rules. Um, authoritarianism, race hatred, and fundamentalist Protestant religion. Those are the predictors of Islamophobia. Uh, and so last thing though, would be the impact of Donald Trump. May have emboldened some of these groups, but the social conditions had to be right in the first place for the rise of of uh, right-wing populism, the Tea Party, we started seeing coming in 2012, and really a 40-year shift of the Republican Party toward uh, more openness to this kind of right-wing alt-right as well. These different, more extreme uh, conservative groups have become mainstream within the Republican Party. This has been going on for about 40 years, but uh, especially, I think, since the uh, turn of the century here, uh, 2001, with the um, with the attacks on U.S. soil, some terrorist attacks, and, uh, and then uh, we went to war in Saudi, I should say, uh, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, just a quick thing, uh, a little 
test here, a little quiz, because I'm a professor, I gotta quiz you a little bit. So, of the, I think it was 19 people that they uh, caught or, or were aware of who were part of that September 11th attack in 2001, how many of them were Iraqis or Afghanis? Zero. Zero. Zero of them, yeah. Yeah, so we go to war with them. So you can see uh, kind of this generalization, this is what we call lumping. Looks like a Muslim will skip. There was an uh, incident in um, the suburbs of, south suburbs of Chicago where a Sikh, you know, you say Sikh or Sikh, mm -hmm. is wearing the, um, they wear turbans, right? And uh, was attacked and, with a machete and the, they caught the guys uh, doing it. But uh, they said, well, it's because they're Muslims. We had the incident in Oak Creek just, was it, seven or eight years ago where they attacked the Sikh temple. They killed the guru as he was coming at them with a butter knife to try to protect the country. He had a butter knife. He was like 83 years old. And uh, he was killed. So uh, this kind of mistaken identity issue, you know, uh, you're the other close enough, but I'm not a Muslim. Whatever, you're a Muslim, oh, I'm going to get you, you know. So this lumping phenomenon, lumping together all people who are different intellectuals, feminists, uh, gays, uh, it's not just race-based, okay? So when you think of hate groups, think more expansively. And that's enough talk for me. My poor students, you can imagine, have to sit there and listen and go on and on and on and on. Uh, questions, comments, tell me off. Here's your opportunities. <laughs>